Morning, everyone. I think it's on the hour, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, very important uh, uh, press conference. We'll be discussing next generation HIV prevention and therapy antibody based approaches. Um, HIV, of course, is a tricky um, virus to combat, and anyone who has been in the field for some time doesn't need to be told that. However, Powerful, broadly neutralizing antibodies, or BNABs as they're known, are widely regarded as the technology that will ultimately allow us to take prevention and treatment of HIV to another level. BNABs are both fascinating and challenging. They raise many questions, and I'm glad you're in the room today because I have this stellar panel that I hope is going to answer some of the questions. Uh, we're just starting to see these antibodies in human clinical trials and in human application. And it's an incredibly exciting area of research that is ongoing in several proof of concept studies with implications for prevention and vaccine fields, as well as treatment in those in acute infection and in later stages of infection. Current studies are teasing out differences between antibodies and deepening our understanding of how these might actually be applied. So I'm, I've met many of you in the context of other vaccine-related research. As you well know, we have HV10702 in the field in South Africa at the moment, um, and you've heard about uh, other vaccine approaches here at this conference, and this really is, I think, the sort of third stream um, around the BNABs uh, that we want to bring to your attention today. Um, as our first speaker said at AIDS 2016, antibodies will play an important, though not necessarily an exclusive role, in a potential HIV vaccine. So these antibodies are what um, uh, we, we really want to talk about today. Um, I'm very proud and excited that IAS 2017 has, has, has had this in the program. There's a, a number of sessions dedicated to this, um, and I think really bears testimony to their importance. Our first panelist is Dr. Anthony Fauci, gave a really fantastic uh, talk yesterday. Many of you know him as a leading voice in, in research. He is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the US National Institutes of Health. He'll provide an overview of the HIV field, describing how anti-HIV antibodies may be effective as long-acting forms of treatment and prevention. Over to you, Tony. Thank you very much, Linda Gale. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I'm going to just take a few minutes to set the stage for the discussions and the questions that will follow. Um, I believe probably everybody in the audience knows that one of the real stumbling blocks to developing a vaccine for HIV as well as to understand the nature of what would be an effective immune response is the body's inherent difficulty in making broadly neutralizing antibodies under the conditions of both natural infection and vaccination. The reasons for this are complex, just starting to be worked out, but the data tell us, as we know from a lot of experience, that in an infected individual who has continual presence of a stimulating antigen in the form of the virus, only about 20% of the individuals who are infected make broadly neutralizing antibody. And importantly, it usually takes them anywhere from two to three years of constant antigenic viral stimulation to develop a broadly neutralizing antibody, which has some very specific characteristics that allow it to be broadly neutralizing, particularly related to hypermutation, long CDRH3s, which is the business end of the antibody that allows it to work its way past the glycans on the envelope into the uh, neutralizing epitope. That's the bad news. The actually somewhat comforting news is that we, as scientists, have the capability with modern technology to rather easily make broadly neutralizing antibody from the cells of individuals who are infected and who have B cell lineage that recognize and that can be cloned to make broadly neutralizing antibody. So on the one hand, the body can't make it very easily alone, but when you pull the B cells out and clone them, you could then make antibodies. And we know that's the case because we have well over 200 
broadly neutralizing antibodies available for our study and use that bind to one of five or six neutralizing epitopes on the envelope. Several of these have been used in vitro. You know the names. They're very familiar now. VRCO1, BNC117, 101074, et cetera, et cetera. A few of these have been put into a form approved by regulatory authorities to actually administer to people. And that's really what we're going to talk about today in the panel and with the discussion. There are three major ways that antibodies can be utilized from the standpoint of administration. One is prevention, passive transfer of antibodies, and you're going to hear about that, namely using it as a means to prevent people who are at risk from getting infected. Two, as a form of therapy, either with individuals who have a ART-resistant microbe. But thirdly, what we've been talking about at the meetings over the last day and a half is a way in an individual who is infected and on ART, if it can be used to withdraw antiretroviral therapy and have the virus continually be suppressed either by the continual presence of the antibody or antibody inducing the kind of response that might have a durable suppression. So there are a lot of exciting things that are going on with antibody and something we thought would be very problematic because it's difficult to induce it with a vaccine or with infection when, as a matter of fact, we now know that they can be used in a very, very productive way in at least three areas of HIV. So I'll stop there, and we'll talk about it a little bit later on. Thank you, Linda Gale. Thanks very much indeed, Tony. Our next panelist is Jintanat Nanorinich. Uh, Jintanat is Associate Director of uh, Therapeutic Research at the U.S. Military HIV Research Program. She oversees the adult HIV therapeutic trials. And she will describe RV397, a study using broadly neutralizing antibodies in people who have just recently been infected. It's important to know that she will be um, presenting the details of her study this afternoon, so you'll be able to get those. But today, she, her remarks will, will couch those, uh, that study for you and, and set it in its scene. So over to you. Thank Jim. you. So the MHRP, the Military HIV Research Program, in partnership with the NIH and others, we've been interested in looking at interventions towards an HIV remission in people who are diagnosed early and start treatment early. This is a group of people who are unique for several reasons. First, they have very low HIV reservoir. Second, they have preserved immunity. And third, they likely have less pre-existing resistance to many of the immune intervention, including the broadly neutralizing antibodies. And we do these studies in our two HIV acute cohorts, the RV254 in Thailand and the 217 in East Africa and Thailand. And in, at this meeting, we're presenting the data from RV397, which is a study that for the first time, VRCO1 is being tested in acutely treated participants. So in this study, we asked people in Thailand in the RV254 cohort who were treated early to come in and ran, get randomized to either getting VRCO1 infusions or placebo. And they get their first dose at time of ART interruption. And then every three weeks for 24 weeks or until they have viral load rebound. And so Dr. Trevor Kroll from our group will be presenting this this afternoon in the ART2 session. We also have another study called RV398, which we're seeing whether if we can give VRCO1 even earlier at time of acute infection, along with ART initiation, whether that could help to reduce viral load in the reservoir more than just ART alone. So we believe that these two studies, the results could really help us and inform how we design future trials, particularly with broadly neutralizing antibodies. Great. Thanks, Jintanat. So just to remind you that that data is embargoed until this afternoon, but it will be presented then. <coughs> so thank you for um, setting the scene for us. Next up is uh, Mike Cohen from the HIV Prevention Trials Network at UNC Chapel Hill. Myron has been part of the HPTN since its inception, one of the world's leading authorities on transmission and prevention of HIV. Many of you will remember HPTN 502. Uh, 
Myron will discuss two multinational clinical trials of an intravenously delivered investigational antibody for preventing HIV infection. Um, I'll leave it to, to Mike to describe those. Over to you. Thanks, Linda Gale. Uh, and I'll try to be fairly specific and use some numbers because these trials are in the field. And so because of that, I'll actually read so I get the numbers actually correct, <laughs> which have otherwise never happened. So the HIV Prevention Trials Network and the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, two, the two NIH networks are working together in two randomized controlled trials. These trials are designed to use antibodies for prevention of HIV acquisition, anti body mediated prevention, hence we call them together the AMP trials. They're organized with the regulatory agents to fit together like hand and glove. <clears throat> One of these trials, um, and, and there, as I said, there are two match pair trials. One of the trials is designed to prevent HIV in 1,500 uh, high-risk young women in Africa. Um, and the second trial is designed to prevent HIV acquisition in 2,400 men who have sex with men in North and South America. Um, in this trial, the study subjects received 10 infusions of the VRCO1 antibody at two different concentrations, or a placebo infusion, over eight weeks. All the subjects also receive a comprehensive background prevention package designed to lower the HIV acquisition independent of the use of the antibodies. The study uh, is designed to determine the concentration of VRCO1 antibody required to prevent HIV-1 infection. The results could, of course, lead to the use of antibodies, this or a future antibody, as a product for prevention um, that could be delivered in a variety of different ways. And the results will certainly be used to inform the vaccine field to understand if a vaccine were capable of inducing a broad neutralizing antibody, what would be the requirements of a vaccine? So there's two really big benefits of this. Moving towards antibodies for prevention by passive administration and informing the vaccine field. Now to date, we've enrolled 1,493 men in the Americas and 923 women in Africa. Uh, the study subjects um, have received just about 6,500, safely received, just about 6,500 infusions. There's greater than 96% retention in this study. Mm -hmm. And so what's been quite amazing to us is the uh, generosity and willingness of the volunteers to participate in what is a challenging study. Uh, the terrific behavior of the site's investigators in, in conducting this study um, and in its success to date. The study has been conducted at a total of uh, 47 sites in 11 countries. The study uh, should be completed in 2021. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And certainly, I think um, you know you, you're getting the catch up. We've launched the idea of this in Durban, and I think it's fantastic to see the accrual. Congratulations! Thank it's you. really wonderful. Our final speaker is Dr. Devin Sock, Director of Antibody Discovery and Development at IRV. Devon's team has elicited broadly neutralizing antibodies to HIV by immunizing cows. Um, these findings offer insights for HIV vaccine design and support further study of modified bovine antibodies as HIV therapeutics or prevention tools in humans. Questions remain about whether effective antibodies could be produced rapidly enough and at a scale suitable enough for widespread distribution if indeed some of the studies you've, you've heard about from Jintanat and, and, and Mike are successful. And so, uh, Devin, over to you to see if this is a potential way to go. Thanks, Linda. Um, so we at the Neutralizing Antibody Consortium um, in La Jolla really believe that the elicitation of broadly neutralizing antibodies will be really important for a vaccine. Um, so the first broadly neutralizing antibodies were discovered in the early 1990s. And we've been trying since then to uh, elicit these antibodies by immunizations, and we failed. Um, and But as Dr. Fauci has mentioned, we've isolated a number of broadly neutralizing antibodies from uh, individuals who are chronically infected with HIV. So this enables us to see what the antibodies look like um, and the features that we can then try and target. Um, so one of the key features, as he also mentioned, is that they have these long, relatively long CDRH3s, uh, so these long loops um, that extend out. Um, and so based on that, uh, we, in working um, with a cow antibody uh, investigator, 
we knew that cows actually have a unique repertoire in that 10 to 15 percent of their antibodies have these ultra-long CDRH3s, the so ultra-long loops. And so we asked the simple question, if we immunize cows that already have these long loops, will we elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies? The protein that we use to immunize these cows is bg 55 sosib uh, So this is a protein that uh, mi mimics what, we, uh, what the protein looks like on the surface of the virus. We've used this to immunize a number of different animal models. So we did rabbits, mice, guinea pigs, macaques, and none of these animal models did we elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies. We immunized four cows. All of them developed broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, and remarkably, not only did they develop really good, broad, and potent responses, but they developed them incredibly rapidly. So in, as soon as, and as quick as 42 days. Um, and so there's a, a number of follow-up studies that we are pursuing from this, but tying it back to HIV vaccine design and how we apply the lessons that we've learned from being able to finally achieve it in, in an animal model by immunization, um, it kind of suggests for us that you know, in, in our attempt to try and create a vaccine, there are a number of different variables that we're trying to optimize and look at and prioritize. And what I think this indicates to us is that if you actually have a pool of antibodies with long loops at the beginning, it makes your ability or your chances of eliciting broadly neutralizing antibodies by vaccination much easier. And so I think it really narrows down our focus of how do we achieve that and how do we enrich for long loops uh, in humans uh, for vaccination. Great. Thank you very much indeed. So the panel is now available for questions, as is our usual. Um, if you can just go to the mic, identify your institution and direct your question, and we'll start on the right. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Smith, mid-page today. A couple of questions for uh, Dr. and I'm going to mangle the name, but Awanorovich. Close? Close. <laughs> Thank you. First question, uh, your, your, your people are reporting today th on this placebo-controlled trial. What sorts of results are we looking at? Just, uh, just they've done it, or are there actual numbers of uh, any, any sense of what, what the, 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 vex the uh, antibodies have done? My, my people is over there, <laughs> Trevor. Hi. He, he's going to present today. And then we're, we're, we're happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one afterwards. But we will be presenting the viral load data based on treatment arms. When we submitted the abstract, the, the study was still blinded. But mm -hmm. now we will present the unblinded results. OK, super. That's great. Um, and a quick question, uh, I think, for, for, uh, for you, Dr. Cohen. The, the study, again, I guess you're not going to have, you, you're not going to actually have results again. You're just going to be design, you're just reporting on the, that the study is happening and, and is going ahead, and you've got good accrual. Correct. This this study is obviously blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled randomized trial that will go for a long period of time. But I think that the goal is to demonstrate the feasibility of the trial uh, since it's gone so well. I think as when you're starting out with something this big, the question is, can you get out of the gate? And the study is actually at 120 percent of the anticipated enrollment at this point in time. So it's gone faster than we anticipated. Um, it suggests that studies like this will be well received by the communities um, who, you know, have to volunteer generously to participate. So this is the first such study of antibodies for prevention. We anticipate there'll be others. Well, super. And one final question for you, Dr. Stock. The, uh, so you're, you're, you're immunizing cows, which is all very well. Um, I guess my question is, in the, the laboratories at, at the NIH and elsewhere, your people are able to, to develop using the B-cell process to get more than 200 antibodies, as Dr. Fauci has said. What's the point of going to the cows? Why, why would one want to take that route rather than do it in the, in the bioreactors in, in the labs? Uh, it was to answer uh, a specific immunological question. So. Um, we use a number of different animal models to, an to ask specific questions, and they all have their caveats and their features. I think the cow is exactly that. It's, it's, a, it's a, a living animal with a specific immune repertoire that have these specific features that, uh, given the right context with the proteins that we have that we've already designed for vaccine design, will they elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies? And I, I think we answered that question um, with a yes. Um, so. From that, how do we apply that back to humans? Um, and, and we did apply the antibody discovery technology to 
these immunized cows and isolated monoclonals that have remarkable breath and potency that we are also furthering for potential applications for therapy as well. Thanks, and Michael, I can say as, as one of the investigators of the AMP study, there really was some skepticism, even you know, in our African context of how, whether people would step up for intravenous infusions. And I think we've all been completely taken aback as to the enthusiasm with which the community has embraced this study and, and have um, flocked to, to enroll. So you know, I think it just, just to endorse mm. what Mike's saying. In that yeah, the, the potential for that is, if successful, and there's always the biz, if successful, that if you can show that an intermittent passive transfer in a high risk group would prevent infection, the next steps are to A, get more powerful antibodies, put them in combination, allow them to be given subcutaneously, and getting a long acting one that would last maybe six months. So instead of having to give it every two months, if you could go in for an injection twice a year to prevent infection, that's a really good way to prevent infection. So the ultimate goal, if we're successful, will be to get longer acting, better administration, subcutaneous versus intravenous, and a more powerful one. Let me just say, and, and we're already, because this isn't static, uh, as Dr. Fauci said, we're already trying to test the next generation for safety uh, durability pharmacology made by the Vaccine Research Center. So there's a really big backlog of products uh, to, to think about. Great. Hi. Hi, I'm Heather Berner from Medscape. And um, this is actually to whoever on the panel would like to respond. Um, we're hearing a lot about this young girl in South Africa who's uh, sustained remission for eight and a half years. But I'm curious in terms, since you guys are doing clinical trials, like what, what can you as scientists take from like an, out, an isolated case? Like how does this how does this feed into the science going forward because, or is this an outlier and it's not something we can learn from? Like, what mm. do we do with this mm. is essentially the question. Good question. Well, you definitely can learn from it. I mean, right. <laughs> so uh, what we're seeing, uh, and we've seen in multiple examples, that when you s treat someone early in the course of infection, the best prototype of that is to treat an infant at the time that they get um, infected. The other prototype is Jean's prototype of having people in her clinic that she can treat almost at the time that they get infected even though they're adults. And what we're seeing is a spectrum, and that's interesting, because there are some people who you treat really very early and you stop therapy and they rebound in three weeks. And we're going to see something, I think Steve Deeks is going to present that soon at this meeting. And then you have some individuals like the Mississippi baby who you treat and they go 27 months. And then you get the French teenager who's gone 11 years, and now you have the South African child who's gone eight years. So what it's telling us, which is interesting, is that there's a broad spectrum from the time you stop therapy to the time you rebound. The exciting thing is, what is it that makes that difference? Is it an immunological response? Is there something special about the virus? Is there immune activation in one individual that you don't see in another individual? So even though it's technically an outlier, it's really very important because it's part of a spectrum of what we're learning. And so is it a piece of it, is it uh, the early treatment? Is that what's, <clears throat> part of what's important here? I think that's critical. I mentioned that in my lecture yesterday. I, I don't think it's ne absolutely necessary, but it's a very important common denominator. The reservoir is smaller when you treat early. You preserve immune function when you treat early. A lot of things help to allow you to rebound later. Anyone want to add anything to that, Jim? Um, yeah, I, I think that, as Dr. Fauci mentioned, I mean, these are infrequent cases, but they're teaching us a lot. And, and even in people who we have not yet interrupt treatment or who rebound fast and go back on treatment, you know, the fact that we can treat early and practically freeze the virus in time before it mutates so much that it escapes to immune response and perhaps in the future when we have effective vaccine, more effective immune interventions, maybe these people would respond better. Mm. So, thank you. Uh, uh, oh, uh, sorry. Well, I think, I think one of the things, this field, the cure field and, and where this is going, 
the metric of that the only metric we have is to stop treatment and see if rebound occurs and then try and figure out the difference between one person and another, I think there's a lot of pressure to look at, to develop alternative strategies to understand the benefit of early treatment and intervention so it would be more predictable that, 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 that benefit had been accrued. And I think many groups are working on that, including Gintanats and, and Tony's. Annette Breindl from BioWorld. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first is at the Sunday satellite session on, on vaccines, there seemed to be um, at least one fraction who thought that the problem with the non-neutralizing antibodies is the same with, as with the neutralizing antibodies, that the good ones come up too late. So are there any studies testing head-to-head non-neutralizing and neutralizing antibodies? Um, and if not, why, like what is the what is the evidence that is so strong for the neutralizing antibodies that you don't think it's necessary to look at it? <laughs> not, not sure of your question, but there, there, there is a significant difference, and this may sound simplistic, I hope it doesn't, between a neutralizing antibody and a non-neutralizing antibody. So a non-neutralizing antibody doesn't neutralize the virus, whereas a neutralizing antibody does, and historically, the gold standard for protection of all viral diseases is neutralizing antibody. Mm -hmm. So the question that came up, and I recall the question in the discussion the other evening, I think it was, was whether or not we have carefully enough yet ruled out non-neutralizing antibodies as really being important, and the only reason they're not doing well is because they come up late. Mm -hmm. Um, in studies in an animal model, which obviously there are always caveats with animal model, that it was neutralizing antibodies that prevented infection and not neutralizing antibody, and not non-neutralizing okay. antibodies. So that's a hint that there is a significant clinically relevant difference between neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies. Having said that, we know from the RV144 study that non-neutralizing antibodies can have a protective effect likely, not yet fully proven, but likely through ADCC. So we shouldn't just throw aside non-neutralizing antibodies. Mm -hmm. They may have an effect or function that has a clinical relevance. That was my question. And it seems like in the, the HVTN trial that has not yet started, I, I always mess up 705 versus 701, but the, mm -hmm. 702. But, See, um, but um, the one that has not yet started, it seems like they are also looking at non-neutralizing right. Both functions. of them are. Both so, of yeah. them are. And so there's no, there's 702 none. is mm -hmm. is fashioned against an African version of RV144. It's a prime boost. It has a vector. It has a protein boost. And the 705 is the same thing, only using a mosaic. So they're really very similar. Let me just add one, <laughs> let me add one thing that might might be clear about the the not, the neutralizing antibodies. We got to the point of the BNABs going into human trials because of in vitro work and animal work with macaques that were protected by the BNAB we're testing, as well as others. In the, but we don't know that these are going to work in humans. This is a real experiment, and so the AMP study, which is very. Uh, um, time-consuming, and, and uh, is, is a real experiment. We, we have to prove that the idea that neutralizing antibodies for prevention of HIV, they act, that idea is correct. And we've been, unfortunately, in the past, mistaken sometimes in our beliefs. And there's a lot of reasons, there's great reason to believe this will work, and there are concerns of why it might not work. And so this study's got a lot of science underneath what we've discussed today. Mm. All right, I have one more question, if I may. Um, how broadly will these things, these approaches, the antibody approaches ultimately be applicable even if they work? Because my understanding is that antibodies, even the generic ones, are more expensive and more complicated to make than small molecules. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on how far this can go, like if it does work scientifically? My, you know, that's, that's a good question that we always get asked. Um, and the answer is, let's prove it works and then worry about how we're going to, I mean, I'm, I'm, let's flash back to 1986 when we first were using AZT and we showed it worked. The first question somebody in an audience like this says, well, you know, can people afford AZT? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, let's worry about that later. Let's just get the drugs. So I think that if you get an antibody that works, antibodies are generally more expensive because they're biologics and biologics are more complicated to make than small molecules. But if we get an antibody or antibodies 
that work, I can guarantee you that we could probably rev it up from a production standpoint to bring the cost down dramatically that it would be available. And the other point is um, we're continuing to isolate additional antibodies. And the more we, I think, more and more really potent antibodies are being uh, discovered, and the more potent they are, the less you have to deliver for them to be effective. And I think that's really going to change their application in the future in a long-term sense. And, and Tony, in his talk yesterday, mentioned other delivery methods that might be uh, change the world, you know, like a vector-mediated delivery. And then already in the field are attempts to make vaccines through sequential immunization um, that would be a different way of making a BNAB. And so this is opening the door. That's what, that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Maybe I'll give my last sort of perspective from the sub-Saharan Africa point of view is, again, I, you know, I think in the prevention field, we're not necessarily thinking about lifelong treatment here. This may be protecting somebody, might mean three or four injections over a, a, a particularly vulnerable period. So, you know, I think the applications are, are certainly open one's mind to, to all sorts of possibilities. To the left. James Gallagher, BBC News. Um, first of all, I was curious about the one in five people that do already produce broadly neutralizing antibodies. Do we understand anything about, is that just random chance or is there something specific about them, some trait that we can learn from them? Then apologies if my second question is really naive, but what's the advantage of antibodies over say PrEP for prevention or current therapies, current drug mm. therapies for mm. treating people with the disease? Good, good question. Mm. Uh, we don't know why 20% make and 80% don't. We don't have yet any genetic uh, correlation with someone's genetic background as to why they make broadly neutralizing antibodies. We do have genetic relationship to people who are elite controllers, but that doesn't seem to have anything to do with broadly neutralizing antibodies. So the short answer to your question is we don't know why 20% do and 80% don't. We do know it takes a long time to them. The second question is an interesting question. There's a broad array of preventions that are used and not one size fits all. I mean, some people may be more comfortable with taking a pill a day. Some people may be comfortable with, you know, having a partner who's on antiretroviral with treatment as prevention and not going to get infected that way. Some people would prefer getting an injection twice a year. I mean, it really is when you ask people, it's your preference. Do you like to wake up in the morning every day knowing you have to take a pill, or would you rather go to a clinic every three to six months to get an injection? So as long as you have a big menu of prevention modalities, then people can essentially pick and choose the one that suits them and their lifestyle the best. And I think for, for instance, infants who are born to mothers with HIV or mothers are breastfeeding, can imagine they come in to clinic for childhood vaccines. Something like this could be incorporated into that system and they could get the injection that would prevent HIV. Great. And for the uh, first question, um, there are a couple of studies where they've looked at um, people over the course of infection, so the Caprisa cohort or the Yayavi uh, Protocol C cohort, um, and one of the main uh, correlations for people who do develop broadly neutralizing antibodies is viral load. So people who are exposed to a lot of virus, a huge diversity of virus, over a long period of time seem to be more likely to develop uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. So that's one of the main things that we've learned. Which is proof that it doesn't do them very good. Seeing no more questions, then um, I'm, I'm hoping you've all been updated on the BNABs, and there is more data to come, as you've heard, uh, th in this afternoon and tomorrow. So uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks to thank a terrific panel.